Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Joy Project. I'm Cristava Pato, your host. It's hot, hot, hot in New York City. We just went through our first heat wave of the summer that was a week long, and I wilt in the heat, so I spent most of it inside writing and working on this podcast. Today's episode was an absolute delight for me to record and edit, and I can't wait for you to meet our guest. Smartphones have turned all of us into photographers. We take pictures of our friends and family, our food, our pets, our selfies, sunsets, gorgeous vistas. If we can see it, we take photos of it. Smartphones change the way we see and capture our world and experiences. Our guest today is Amy Selwyn, a friend I met on Twitter almost 15 years ago through the writing community. Less than a year before the pandemic started, she gave herself a gift that completely and unexpectedly changed nearly every aspect of her life. And she's here to tell us all about it. Amy, welcome to Joy Project. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm excited to have this conversation with you too. Please share with us what it is that brings you joy. Well, I love the question. And the answer is really easy for me. That What brings me joy is photography and the practice of photography, the craft of photography, looking at photography, but really it's making photographs. I've, I've been a writer all my life. And so I always thought that I was a textual person, that words were my thing. And they are, I love them. When I turned 60, I gave myself a present of going on a photo workshop to Cuba. And I thought, well, this will be amazing because I've always wanted to go to Cuba. And then I get to combine it with learning something new. And I asked, specifically. Do you have to be a photographer? To do? Oh, no, 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 it's fine. You don't have to be expert or anything. And I got there and there were six fabulous photographers and me. I was the beginner. Huge lesson in that. I mean, just a huge lesson. And the wonderful person who was leading the, the workshop said to me, you're the one I envy. And I said, why? And he said, because you're the beginner. You get to fall in love with this all over. I just do it now. I, I love it, but I don't get to fall in love. And I really have fallen in love with this idea of the visual language that you can show a story, an emotion, their story, their essence, their, that moment. You are making uh, memories. You are capturing them right then and there. And that's what just, I find it joyful. I really do. I basically have left everything else behind in my life. And now photography and writing to some extent are my entire life, which is amazing. It is amazing. And what drove you to do that workshop? I, I definitely wanted to go to Cuba. And as a photographer, what I assumed it would mean, and it turned out it did, was that I wouldn't be necessarily just hitting the sort of tourist hotspots that I might get a feel for because it was street photography in Cuba. So I'm, I would get an actual feel for what the streets felt like, plus some tourist locations. But really, it was the, the grit of that beautiful Cuban spirit. Are there certain memories from that trip that are really visceral? Yeah, what a great question. There was one night in Havana. So we, we went to Havana, Cienfuegos, and Trinidad. So three different places. And when we were in Havana, we went to, it's a gathering place in a pretty dicey neighborhood, a rarity in Havana, uh, not, not so many dicey neighborhoods, but this one, and dicey because there's a lot of late night activity and a lot of alcohol in this part of the, of this part of the city. There's live music and people dance, and there's hundreds and hundreds, possibly thousands of people who dance. It's called Tropical. We went there and I remember thinking to myself, this country, these people have a soundtrack. They are moving through life to a rhythm that is so beautiful. And I fell in love with it then and there. That was really kind of one of the, the major memories. I thought you can have all kinds of stuff in your life, but this is not a material thing. This is something that is just an essence, a way of looking at life and at the temporal quality of it. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? So they're dancing now. And I thought that is not how I'm living my life. And I really, I could take some lessons from this. I'm going to change my life. Exactly. Because of this trip. And because I'm yes. photographing these people, they have something to teach me about life. Absolutely. When I came home and I started printing some of them, I was so struck by the looks in people's faces, there was an acceptance of life and, and a pride in themselves. 
And I thought, I need that. I need to find that for myself. Nobody can give it to me, but I'm going to find that. And then lo and behold, less than a year later, COVID came along. What an opportunity to just be at home and figure it out. And what was it? What did you change about your life? I've always had an artist's soul. And I told myself that can be a hobby or you can do that when you retire. It, but it's not, it's not a function. It's a way of being. It's, and, and I just said, just let it out. Sing in the afternoon. Do whatever you want to do. Make photographs at home. I, I don't know, whatever you want to do. I started signing up for classes. I took great stuff. And I gave myself the freedom. And I, I think I just said, I'm not going to worry about whether or not I am winning a Guggenheim. I'm not. Or whether or not I'm being paid thousands and thousands for a print. The old markers of success tied to some achievement or some financial gain. I just said the achievement is in the process. And I really meant it. Once the genie was out of the bottle, I couldn't put her back in. <laughs> you don't have to just be in New York or LA or Chicago to experience wonderful cultural and artistic experiences and to find communities to be involved. I mean, and mm -hmm. hopefully give back to the community or give to the community. We are such soul sisters in that way, because we've been on that same journey and parallel path. Absolutely. And it sounds it sort of sounds like a platitude because a lot of people, sure. oh, you know, carpe diem, seize the day and all this stuff. But when it really hits mm -hmm. someone we care about, mm -hmm. get sick or someone we love dies, or something changes in the world. And let's not forget the political backdrop sure. against which all of this is happening, where our freedoms are eroding right. in many ways, or there's threat there, and there's funding issue for arts groups and museums are closing and all that stuff is happening. We can only live in one tense, the present. Mm -hmm. And while I walk around believing that the actuaries are right, and you probably got another 25 or 30 years, who knows? I don't know. And I do think that that lesson and example is really pronounced in a place like Cuba. They have absolutely no idea what's going to happen from one day to the next. So they're living it now. And, and I was so struck by it. Are there certain parts of that process that they light you up more than others? Or like the real joy of photography is in a certain part for you? For me, it is not the technical. I've learned because it helps to know how to use your camera. Lots of people buy super expensive equipment and then put it on auto. You could save a lot of money that way. You could get a less expensive camera. I taught myself and took some classes to be able to work manually. There are two things that I really, really love. One is what Dorothea Lang called the point of departure, which is your emotional state. Before you set out with your camera, whether you're a street photographer, a landscape photographer, pet photographer, whatever your portraits, what's your emotional point of departure? Where are you coming from? Because otherwise you're standing on a street corner or whatever you're doing, you're working in your studio and you try to make some photos, just make something pretty. Or so a project that I, that I worked on for quite a while was that I was alone in my house, like a lot of other people. And I felt like I was aging in isolation. I wasn't depressed about it. I was just sort of curious and I thought, when this all ends, what's going to have changed here? Um, will I be all gray? What will? How many wrinkles will I have? It was all just sort of experimental, but I was curious. My point of departure was really, I'm curious and I'm willing. I'm willing to expose myself to the camera because I didn't have any models. It was just me, myself, and I. And the other part that I really love, and it took me a while to understand where this came from. I bought a printer. I didn't know anything about how to print, photograph printer. I taught myself how to print. I still have a lot to learn, but I absolutely love the art of printing. It took me a while to realize both my grandfather and my father were engravers of paper. So I have ink running through my veins and I swear it's genetic. I love printing. And I think it's tapping into something that's just there. Right after I returned from Cuba, I actually became very depressed and I went into an acute depression. I have so much empathy for people who experience this on a long-term basis or chronic. Uh, I've never felt anything like this in my life, ever. I tend to roll on a kind of a high note and this was just gutting. And what it was, was 
the genie making her way out of the bottle and me trying to stuff it back down. So when I came out of that depression, I mean, that was really huge. Once it was gone and I saw my psychiatrist a lot and took antidepressants, I was open to anything to get past this, get through it. And once I was through it, I was able to look back and say, that happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not the same person. And whatever it was I was so afraid of, failing, disappointing, I don't know, not being who I thought I was, it no longer mattered. What brought you out of the depression? In a big way, it was photography because I just literally shot my way through it. I would just make image after image of whatever. And I would always think about what's your point of departure. And it wasn't sadness. It was that there is beauty in the world. There is beauty and I can find it. And I started this thing. I still do it every day, although I don't really need it anymore. But I started every day. I began my day with one tweet that said positive thought to start the day. I did it to help myself. But then I, people would say to me, I really look forward to it. And it was just this way of saying, look, I'm not going to say, I'm so lucky, I'm depressed, yay. No, it wasn't like that, but I could find something good in a day. I could be really grateful for my friends or my sisters, my dog, and it helped. It really helped. I mean, you are a a real role model for someone who can talk about what's real and then say, and here's what I'm doing about it. And I have faith in the people who are helping me. That was a big message that really came through with your own stories. Oh, thanks, Amy. It's one of the reasons why when I was thinking about starting this podcast, and I've been thinking about Joy Project now since a a year before the pandemic. So it's been a long time coming and making this podcast. It started out as a film project (laughs) that we couldn't film in New York City because of COVID. And so I didn't know if I wanted to make a podcast. And then finally, like, who knew that we would be in year three of the pandemic? And I thought, this is just ridiculous. And then after everything I'd been through this last year with my health, I felt like I, I got to do something. And, and one of the things that I love about the idea of joy is that it, it's not it's not the same as happiness. It's not the same as optimism. Joy can live alongside pain and disappointment and depression and anxiety. And it's exactly what you said of like, these days were terrible, but I could find something to be grateful for and joyful about in a really terrible day. And that makes a huge difference. I think it's how I got through cancer. Joy got me through cancer. Science did and modern medicine and my doctors and my friends and my family and so many other contributing factors by embracing joy and embracing gratitude. It allowed the medicine and the science to work as well as it possibly could. Absolutely. We heal, whether that's medical healing or mental health healing, which is also medical, but we heal faster, more effectively, more powerfully, more authentically, if we believe in it. If you're fighting it every step of the way, it's it's not going, it's probably not going to go as well. Mm-hmm. And I do think that joy, as exactly as you said, is not it's not an exclusive state of being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the really hard stuff, oftentimes the really hard stuff makes the joy kind of come out in, in, in relief Mm -hmm. stands out. It's um, you just think, but there's that. Yeah. Or you go see a film that just leaves you in a puddle or see an art exhibit or, or whatever, hear an author, read his or her, or it's work. And you just think that's, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also, it's active, right? Like we're seeking out joy. We're making joy. We're providing joy for other people. It's, it's a verb as much as it is a a noun. It is. And I, I really, I, I love that idea uh, of that. And I, I think that in so many ways, that's what your photography is, right? It's what, what you saw at yes. Anthropical, right? Was right. this, it was joy. It was that it's expression joy. of yeah. joy in those people it who was. were living in and, and keep us a, a difficult place to live, yeah. regardless of who you are there, right? right. It's like, there are right. difficulties yeah. in Cuba that we know nothing about no, nothing. here in this country. 
if they could find a way to be joyful, if they can yeah. dance, if they can sing, if they can play music, if they can, they yeah. can find a way. And I love how you say that you, you shot your way out with photography. It's very similar to what writers do. If we write our way out, you yeah. write your way out of the depression, exactly. you write your way out of the sadness, out of the anxiety. Yep. And it doesn't mean that it totally goes away, but it gives you some place to put it right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it, and it also ident- helps identify for you what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what am I really thinking? I, I often can't figure out how I feel about something until I've either written about it or now more recently made photographs about it. And then I'll look at the photograph and think, I had no idea that's what I wanted to do, but I, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. I was taking a self-portraiture class and I took it against every fiber in my being was saying, you sure you want to do this? And it's like, yeah, I think I should. I, I want to try it. We'd made some self-portraits and it was all online and every week we'd meet. And then finally, the class was over. It hadn't been a big triumph for me. I didn't feel like, oh, I did some really interesting work. I, it was okay. The class was over. And I one day I thought, I want to make a self-portrait involving this whole concept of fertility, facing the fact that I will not, I'm definitely not going to have children. Do I feel less feminine or the same? Or am I a woman if I haven't had children? The same issue that many, many people explore. And I don't know what made me do it, but I have this bird's nest. It's not a real one. I bought it on eBay, I think, or Etsy. I bought it on Etsy. And then I took these quail eggs and I broke them. And I just had broken shells in the nest and I put it on my pelvis and I shot, I was holding the camera up by my face and I shot downwards. I was lying in bed. Really what you were seeing was primarily my hips, my pelvis and my thighs. And I thought that's my self-portrait. That is a self-portrait. It was one of the most revealing and yet honest photos. I thought, well, wow, that's certainly not a selfie. It's full of intention and meaning and lyricism. And it felt wonderful after I did it because I thought, wow, I have really learned there is a joy in just taking your camera, taking my camera and and making it part of myself, documenting myself, my feelings, my emotional state. I loved doing that. And that's really when you talked about your emotional point of departure. I mean, talk about an emotional point of departure, right? Like you are saying something, someone's going to look at that photograph and look twice and look three times and look four times. You're like, what, what's happening here? Like what, what is she trying to say? And that it's so raw, honest. Was it also healing for you? Very much so. It was because I, I like to use text not as an, not in a company, not like this photo is about, no, but to use some text alongside it. And I found it was so positive. It was so positive that the text that went along with it was really about acceptance, being a woman, that being whoever you are, identity, being whatever you are, is not necessarily contingent upon whether you have done what society tells you you should have done. And then that opened me up to a a number of amazing photographers working out there today who are dealing with identity and showing respect for identity. And it's just been, I mean, that's what I mean. I, I, people say you go down rabbit holes, but it's more like, oh, it goes from one fabulous experience to the next. It's like a, just a wonderful place to be. Amy, I love that so much. And I also love that it freed you. Every photograph feels like it's freeing you yes. a little bit more yes. to be more of who you are, whether it's a self-portrait, whether it's a picture that you're taking, what is next for you on your photography journey? What's happening next? Oh, well, now I get to talk about this part, which is so exciting. So, um, I begin my MFA in photography, my Master's of Fine Arts in Photography at Maine Media. It's a low residency program, so I I won't be moving into a college dorm anytime soon. So I will spend three, the next three years exploring my work and doing new work, of course, learning 
all about photography. And it's not a, a highly technical program. It's not, it's not so much around the, the, the technical aspects of photography as, I mean, you have to know how to use your camera and we'll learn a lot more, I'm sure. But it's really around the emotions and the use of photography as a fine art. And I could not be more excited. I've wanted to, to study for an MFA for 33 years. And I, I got in 33 years ago for writing, not for photography. And I turned it down because my father, whom I adored, said to me, this is a terrible idea. You have a great career ahead of you. I was at the time working for the New York Times. And this is terrible. And, you know, you, you can be like Wallace Stevens. He was a poet on the side, but he worked in insurance. And you know what? It wasn't right. It wasn't right at the time. And who knew that the MFA would be in photography and visual arts? I had no idea. So everything happens at the right time for a reason. So that is what is next. I'm so excited for you. you. And it's, it is that full lesson of trusting the timing of your life. Who knows why at 63, yeah. this was the path. What we seek is also seeking That's us. That's right. We'll get to where we need to get to as a huge fan of you and your photography. I cannot wait to see where this MFA takes you. And I just think that program is so lucky to have lucky. your spirit and that your fellow students wow are so lucky to get to have you in their, in their orbit, the way that I'm so lucky. Really beautiful. Thank you. I, I feel incredibly lucky. I do. I pinch myself all the time and think, wait a minute, like I'm, I'm really doing, I'm really doing this. Yeah. It's, it's so exciting. You're doing it. Yep. You're doing, doing it. it. That's the joy. Amy, if somebody wanted to find out more about your photography or what you do, what, what is the best way for someone to either get in touch with you or to learn more about right. your work or see your work? What, what's the best way to sure. do that? Two ways. One is on Instagram where I am Amy Selwyn photographer that I have uh, links in my bio so that you can go to my website or the website itself, which is amyselwyn.photography. So instead of photographer, it's photography. And I have a selection of work on there. It's many, many, many more photographs are on Instagram. I sell my prints. I'm hoping to put together a book. I have put together a zine that's for sale. But more than anything else, it's not about the commerce. I would love someone to just, just look. And if they, if, if something strikes them, just tell me or ask me a question or get in touch. That's what I really would love. Amy, thank you so, so thank much you. for coming to Joy Project. I hope that you will come back and chat with us and let us know how the MFA is going, yeah. how your photography journey is going. This has been super inspiring for me. Uh, and I'm just so grateful oh, that you chose to spend some time with thank us. Thank you so much. You can, I'll come back anytime. I'm going to be thinking about the question, what's my point of departure every time I do anything? What a lovely way to be in the world. Now that the heat wave's broken, Amy's inspired me to run out into the world and take more photos and to be mindful of why I'm visually capturing certain moments. Thank you so much, Amy. I loved our conversation. At the end of every podcast episode, I share something that brought me joy this week related to the episode. As Amy begins her MFA in photography, she's adjusting her budget to afford her classes. She told me that she's downsizing to a smaller space so she has more time and more money for her art. I also live in a small space, and Amy's downsizing inspired me to rearrange my apartment and clean out some clutter to change up the energy and to give me new perspective. I'm not the greatest homemaker or decorator, but lately I found myself really wanting to learn more about interior design and to spruce up my own place. Apartment Therapy is a website and Instagram account I love because they feature a lot of small spaces and show how to make them functional and beautiful. One recent post featured graphic designer Sophie Eleanor. She now lives in her grandmother's cottage in New South Wales, Australia. She said the home already had a lot of love in it when she moved in, but as she's been decorating it, her goal was to bring joy to the surface, and that absolutely shows in her design. I love that idea. It's what I try to do with each episode of this podcast. Bringing joy to the surface means it's always there. It's just a matter of shining a light on it. I especially love the idea of a joyful home. So as I rearranged my apartment, I kept joy in mind. When I thought about what to keep, what to donate, what to add, 
I focused on the joy factor of each placement. I'm not quite done yet, but I did post some photos before and after on my Instagram and Twitter accounts, and I'm going to keep posting them as I do my best to bring joy to the surface in my home and in my life. Thank you so much for choosing to spend part of your day with me. A big thank you to Amy for sharing her joy of photography with all of us. You can find her on Twitter at Amy Selwyn, A-M-Y-S-E-L-W-Y-N, on Instagram at Amy Selwyn Photographer, and at her website, Amy Selwyn Photography. You can find me on Twitter at Krista NYC, on Instagram at Krista Rose NYC, and through the website for this podcast, KristaAvampato.com slash Joy Project, where you can also find links to everything we talk about on the podcast, as well as show transcripts for each episode. I'll be back in two weeks on Tuesday, August 9th, with another episode of Joy Project. Until then, take care of yourself and take care of each other. I hope you have a joy-filled week, and I'll chat with you soon. And if you get out into the world and take some photographs, please send them to me because I would love to see them and share them.